Okay, we have reached the ever popular council initiated discussion segment of the council meeting and for the new council members Let me explain what this is because it's not inherently obvious from the title The agenda for both the open and closed session is completely determined by NHGRI and your very patient listeners as you sit here for two days and do exactly what we ask you to do and exactly when we ask you to do it so we're mindful of the fact that we have to give you an opportunity to take control of the conversation. So this is your opportunity to um, bring to our attention reports that you would like to hear in the future, uh, speakers you would like us to invite to come and present either in open or closed session. Um, we have even in the past had uh, an FOA be birthed as a result of a council initiated discussion where someone said, you really need to think about conducting research in this area or using this particular format or mechanism. So it's a time when we basically turn the microphones over to the council and ask, what's on your mind? Uh, are you hearing fears and concerns or misinformation coming out of the community? You're actually, you're advising us, but you're also representatives of the research community. So if you think there's messages that you're hearing from your colleagues that we should be aware of. This is your opportunity to bring it up. Or other things you want to tell us, including things you want to hear about at future council meetings and the like. Joe and then Carol. I'll just bring up what I just mentioned to Eric a moment ago, and it has to do with the discussion that's ongoing in the community about the reevaluation or the continuing evaluation of the role of models. And what stimulated me to think about this is what Howard said about the potential reluctance of very powerful tools to, to be able to understand human disease and what it might take to get folks more engaged in the basic component and realize from the basic side that maybe everything isn't going to function the same in people. So this kind of, um, there is, there's been a lot of debate. I know, Eric, you've written about model organism databases, and Francis Collins has talked about model organisms, and that's mostly around funding. But I think really the underlying issue has to do with, you know, really the value or, or, or assessing the value of current models or other models that might be thinking about, for example, primate models that, might be very expensive to implement, but might be used very useful in this, sort of, for example, marmoset models. So um, anyway, that's that's something I know is going on in the in the community that I think there's some interest in having further discussion about. And some of this discussion is happening at the institute director level. I think part stimulated by this these issues around the model organism databases and just general discussion. Um, even about, you know, what, what, you know, we create these communities and yet uh, through a 2016 lens wondering if that's, you know, if that's the right framework for much of the work we do. So I think that's a good point. We're going to do Carol and then Aviv. Uh, okay, sure. Then do the first. I, I wanted to say the two things I've heard in that context. The first has been characterization of the model organisms with very modern tools, genomic tools. Um, which can be applied now and maybe couldn't be applied five years ago. Single cells is an example of that. Not my own research, so I'm not in conflict on this specific aspect of single cells, but that's what we hear from people. Could it at this lens, it would be easier to compare model A, B, and C to human? And so something more systematic would be done like that. And the other context for that is because of the tremendous advances in genetic engineering tools, that those are uniquely possible to apply only in uh, models. You're not going to start CRISPRing people to test what would happen when you do this and when you do that, but you can do that absolutely to the model organisms. And yet, when I look at the NAGRI activities, we also discussed this in the Beyond ENCODE workshop, genetic manipulation doesn't play a major role as coupled to genomics, and it always looks a little bit like a hole. And I think people do comment on that. Carol? So I, I just wanted to say how much um, I enjoyed both of the presentations. So Dr. Gibbons' presentation followed by um, Adams, you know, that, that juxtaposition. It would be great to have more of that. Um, I, I really think that shows the, the partnership 
and the, the benefits of the partnership of NHGRI with the other ICs. I really, I really enjoyed that. Um, and I thought we had uh, talked about it last time, but one of the things I really would like to have us, um, a visitor or a speaker I'd like to have is, is the new NLM director. Um, and as you know, as soon as we can get her here, I think she. I would really like to hear from her. So let me comment on that. I appreciate the feedback. Um, more specifically about the NLM director, I thought it was not a very nice thing to do to ask her to speak at council two or three weeks after she officially started. So we already have her slated for February. But you made an interesting point, and we should give some thought to this. That maybe, when possible, we should directly couple. Um, a present when we have someone like the NLM to maybe have a coupled with an update on what we are doing in areas of synergy around the NLM so we could think about it whether that's BD2K or some other programs so we should think about that as we schedule her and she's already scheduled all ready to go for February I would also although I haven't asked her yet I would imagine we'd probably want to get Deanna Bianchi here fairly quickly and she starts next month so I think it's fair to ask her to come in February but somebody needs to remind me to get her invited and at some point, we also want to have Josh Gordon, the new head of NIMH. So again, we can calculate whether that should be February, whether that could wait till May, we'll determine. But there's no question that when new leaders come on board, especially with people and, uh, who are representing institutes we have relationships with in a significant way, we want to get them here as quick as possible. No question. Um, yeah. Just, I guess, a follow up on Joe's point as well. And I'm new on council, obviously. And so maybe this is something you guys already have discussed in the past. but. Um, not only to think about the MOD databases, but just it, I would very much enjoy participating with, with program and thinking about, you know, if provided the goal of this exercise is to link genetic variants to disease, or an important goal, what are the right data and analyses to do that? Is it the MODs? Is, that, is it single cell sequencing? Is it other layers of data and types of analyses? I think there's just a really a timely discussion that, that a lot of us are having outside of this room in, in those kinds of issues. Just to, just to maybe expand a little bit more what you're saying, what, what are you thinking, that you're talking strategically just talking with programs or you're saying this is an area that you feel is not well developed where some a broader conversation in the community would be helpful or Fresh look. Would well, be first, first in this room among council members, and then, and and certainly, you know, and I think some of the workshops that you guys are running at the moment are are designed to raise some of these questions anyway. But I think, you know, the, the Joe's question comes, you know, in, in the context of of, you know, um, any anything that we we support should should bear on on linking human genetic variants to disease, and and if you think about the mods in that sense. Um, you can start to judge their, their relative value in relative to other things that you might do. So anyway, I, I just think it's a very interesting discussion that, that seems to lie at the root of some of these mm -hmm. decisions. Howard? So I have two things. Uh, so one, I, I put Bob uh, on the spot. <clears throat> um, Bob gave a nice talk at the Insight uh, meeting where he was talking about some of the payer issues that are going on, and I don't know if Bob wants to, to mention a, any details about this in the open session, but, you know, some of the individuals you were talking about, it'd be great to get them to come to council and get to meet council, uh, and maybe there's a bridge that could be built uh, between those uh, companies that are involved in assessing quality of, of, of it, and I don't know if you want to talk about that, so I'll, I'll leave that open if you want to mention names or whatever, that's fine. And the second thing that I think would be really useful is, you know, this whole issue of epidemiology and how do you bring whole genomes or whole exomes or high density DNA into the epidemiology side? Because that is part of the challenge that we're facing is that we bring everything to an average level and then we move away from that. And really, the case control issue is how do we do that? And I think there's, I, I don't know enough about it. Uh, Terry can probably discuss much more about that. But how do we bring genomics to epidemiology at a, at a genome-wide, I think is an interesting question. Bob? Uh, is this open still? We're open. OK. Um, so I think um, um, it's a very wide range of, of uh, groups that are providing evidence to third-party payers about the value or lack thereof of genomics and, and genetic testing. Um, as, 
I think one of the primary people that everyone looks to, very much so, is Palmetto and the Moldy X program there, which is run by Dr. Elaine Jeter. And I think, I, I can't speak for her, but I, I think she might be interested in interacting with us. I don't know. Um, that, 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 that would be one possibility. The other is, you have had um, Naomi, I'm blocking on her. Yeah, from uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield Tech Assessment. She's been engaged and involved already with you. So in the same vein of looking at overlaps and synergies and the ways that the different programs can um, not reinvent the wheel or can really rely on the kind of evidence that's being created. Um, and I, I think there's something coming up that I'm on to look at for a supplement you know, to look at the ways that um, non-genetic physicians are, um, are um, sorry, I'm, I'm really, I really am actually not feeling well today. But in any case, it's the thing that Dave Kaufman is going to introduce. Um, so, and it's about surveying people about something that, that actually several people have mentioned about the ways, the needs that non-genetics clinicians have for knowledge, for information about about uh, genomic medicine, okay. So in any case, so it's just sort of generally, I'm I'm just really alert to this, um, and and I'm just one person. I've got my own lens. For example, the SEER, the new SEER programs, which are really exciting, um, you know, cover a range of new topics for for the LC uh, SEERs, and that including the privacy and security that Alan Clayton and, and Brad Malin at Vanderbilt are going to do, I think could be potentially really helpful to uh, other people in other parts of the Genome Medicine Consortia. Um, and likewise, um, I think that um, the, the ways that we've had LC embedded research in some programs, and now we're moving sort of beyond that. Um, and so, and I think that that is, it could be seen as a really great thing because I don't think ELSI then is a separate thing. I think it's become very much a part of the goals of the, of the program. Um, for example, um, uh, disparities and genome and genomics. Um, so that you could think the Caesar two programs and those RFAs, which called for either for, 40% or no, 25% or 60% of, of participants who are going to be, you know, from diverse populations, that that is, that in itself is embedding ELSI. And I think that's brilliant. However, I'm wondering if everybody else sees it that way. And I'm wondering the way, the other, so the main question is, how are there synergies around many of the programs that have been described to council? And how can we make better use of the things that, because it's really tough. It's, it's really tough to know everything that's going on. And yet I think there's some really, there could be at least some great bridging going on. And I also think to the PMI. So that's my, sorry, long-winded comment. Sure. Um, I, I would echo the... Howard's comment about epidemiology and genomic epidemiology, I think that many people in epidemiology have very sophisticated epidemiology modeling, and then they pick a single SNP or a single, you know, I don't know, polymorphism, and really are not grasping how important the genomic aspect of that work is, and I, and I think that's critical. I, I do think that there's a lot of uh, advancement being made in electronic health records with regard to patient portals. I know now every physician I see has a different version of my chart or Cerner has one. Uh, and they're quite good with regard to being able to download your data, being able to contact your physician, and whether it's, or at least leave a message, whether it's worth thinking about some of those models with regard to uh, subjects in our genomic studies and, and using similar kind of models with abilities to log in and send comments and get data, um, whether it might be will, worthwhile to have some discussion about that. How electronic health records are making data available to patients and how that those kind of models could be used in research. And in, in particular, what context to have that discussion? Again, you'd like to hear this at a 
council level or at a uh, well, I, I guess I'm new, so um, I probably could get advice on what the best context is, but it just seems to me we have, it sounds like from what we heard today, there are more and more NHGRI projects where we're, we're generating genomics data from patients who expect to get the data back, um, but it doesn't seem we talk much about the platforms. I mean, there's a lot of return of results research and kind of what they want, but I'm talking more technically taking advantage of some of the platforms being developed to really ease that. Obviously, it'll be critical for the PMI, but even for many NHGRI consortia, that would be important. Okay. Jeff and Dave. I want to pick up on a question about uh, the cost and economic issues, and it's really more of a question, uh, you know, at that stage now where genomic information really is translating into clinical care, perhaps a lot on a research basis, but increasingly on a clinical basis, too. And I'm not aware of a, much of a robust literature out there on cost effectiveness. And I'm wondering whether, as these initiatives go forward, whether there's a real opportunity to bring in the health economists to help understand uh, uh, how to analyze, how to collect the data, how to uh, begin to draw a few conclusions about uh, how uh, these services ought to be uh, structured to maximize cost effectiveness, uh, and obviously that's going to help with third party payers and their decisions about how to how to cover this stuff. So just a question about whether the, it's the field is mature enough to be uh, bringing in those sorts of colleagues. Um, Larry, do you want to someone take a, a, a I mean we, this comes up frequently around health economics and some with genomic advances and there's thing, it, some of it, it falls within the division of genomic society. We have done some things, and Larry, and there's some things we haven't done, and there's some cautions about what we can and can't do, but maybe Larry should comment about this. So we, we are supporting, Close are supporting to the mic. Some, some focus grants in this area as well as embedded grants in this area. The caution is that there are boundaries as to what the NIH can and can't do, which recently were revised. Um, what I'm getting at is, I mean, the, the NIH is limited on in the research side to doing research, not necessarily deciding which is the most cost-effective treatment. Uh, and so, up until those up to those boundaries, we are trying to push this a little bit, but we um, have to be cautious about. It. Dave. So there's a NIH program called SEPA, that's the Science Education Partnership Awards. These are uh, K through 12 innovative uh, science education uh, designed for bringing research experiences to K through 12. And I would say more than 50 percent of them have a genomics component. Might be worthwhile to have the program director, Tony Beck, come and talk to us a little bit about that if, if there's interest. Is Carla Easter? <laughs> Carla, do you want to, I know you know a thing or two about SEPA. Do you want to come to a microphone and make a comment and what interactions we've had with that program and so forth? Yeah, so uh, we've actually spoken with Tony several times, uh, and you're right, there are several of the SEPAs that do have a genomic component, and in the past we've actually done sort of supplements to the DNA Day program um, to help some of the groups that had already had SEPAs do some more engagement around DNA Day, but I think it's an excellent idea. We've worked very closely with Tony on a number of different things, and uh, I think the potential is there for us to work even closer with him. Um, but he actually has come to a DPCE meeting before and talked a lot about the program in the past. So there's interactions with their division where the education program resides. Anyone else or anyone on the phone want to weigh in? Okay, ready? All right, that was pretty comprehensive. We'll compare notes and be back in touch. A uh, couple of administrative things. Um, the announcements and items, items of interest. We have two reports from two societies, the American Society of Human Genetics and the National Society of Genetic Counselors. These are uh, descriptions of their activities since the last council meeting. You can find those reports by going to NHGRI's webpage, find the council page. You'll find a copy of the open session agenda, and they're linked to that if you want to know about activities in those two societies. So um, 
At this point, maybe Jeff, you want to come up to the podium, please? Yeah. Okay, well, let me give it a draft. All right. <laughs> 